Brooke Spencer is, can you wave Brooke? Can we, hello, this is Brooke, Brooke's here. Brooke's, Brooke Spencer is a senior manager of international strategy at Walmart. And she helps craft the message of customer centered offerings for 11 different markets worldwide. She leads strategic messaging for executive presentations, um, including financial modeling, business case logic, and marketing intelligence. Um, she transitioned to Walmart after spending six years in oil and gas uh, with companies such as BP and Devon Energy. She's highly experienced. She has her MBA, her BBA. Um, she's a co-instructor right now of an MBA management, strategic management course. Um, and we just feel really privileged to have her and um, her generosity in sharing her knowledge with us. And so we, I'm gonna pass it off to Brooke. And again, if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat as we go. Brooke, take it from here. Great, thanks, Stacy. Can you guys see my screen that I'm sharing here? Let me get some thumbs up. Yes, excellent. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. Again, my name is Brooke Spencer. Um, I uh, have a background in finance and strategy, and so I'm super excited to give you this presentation today. Uh, I'm by no means a data scientist. I won't pretend that I am, but what I'm here today is sh to show you how impactful data can be for every person and every job and every idea that you have. So tonight, we're going to walk through why data is important, the difference between basic data and an insight, and then how you can use your data to tell a really good story. So um, we are going to have some breakout rooms tonight. So as Stacy said, please be ready to engage. Please be ready to talk to the other people in your room. Um, I think that's one of the best parts of a, of a presentation like this. So we're going to kick it off and let's talk about why we need data. OK, so data is critical for identifying problems, testing solutions and improving products. Basically, you can't improve what you can't measure. This framework I'm showing you here is one that's commonly used in the Lean Six Sigma process improvement, which is like the holy grail of improving anything. And the second step in it is to measure because you have to measure something before you can improve it. So data when used correctly can help you prove or disprove your hypothesis. And when you use it to be persuasive, it means that your argument is indisputable when you use data correctly. So super important to have data. We all need it for all of our jobs. Now there are two types of data that I'll highlight for you tonight, qualitative and quantitative. So qualitative is more long form, open responses. You might collect it through something like a survey or a focus group or an essay. And it's usually sentences and responses um, that don't have quantitative numbers in them. Like they don't have numerical values, they're more open-ended. Then there's quantitative data. Now quantitative data, has to have a numerical value. You should be able to do calculations with it. It normally collects a much larger sample size because you can aggregate the data easier. Um, and the questions are normally very close-ended. So something like multiple choice questions, um, could be you know, percentages, rankings, ratings, things like that. Those are all quantitative. Now, when you're doing research and you're say, for example, investigating customer needs, you might start with a qualitative survey to sort of get a lay of the land and understand what your customers need and what the options are. Then you can narrow your survey down and pick maybe one or two options that you wanna highlight with very specific quantitative follow-up questions. So it takes a big problem like customer needs and it narrows it down into really precise pieces of quantitative data that you can then use to tell the story that you need to. So tonight we're going to focus on the quantitative data side of it. So how do we get quantitative data? There are really two ways. You can do primary research, which is where you go out and you conduct the survey or the quiz or the focus group or whatever it is, and you collect the data firsthand and do the analysis. So it's your data, you own it, you found it. The other one is you can go get secondary or existing data from other databases. So you can go to government websites, sports websites, anyone that has open source uh, data that you can export, you can go pull from there. Now, when you're collecting secondary data, you have to be really careful that what you're pulling is good data. It's way too common that you can end up with bad data. And I'm going to show you an example of that tonight. So when you're using secondary sources, make sure they're verifiable sources, that they're good quality, that it doesn't come from somebody's uh, unreputable blog. 
uh, and you want to make sure they're using a representative sample. So a large enough sample size, they surveyed enough people, they collected enough data that it can truly represent the population you're trying to extrapolate conclusions to. Um, when you're looking at these, I have a, a list, and Stacy has a resource handout too, of a bunch of different open databases that you can go to to collect all types of data. So there are things like um, baseball statistics or Bureau of Labor statistics. The CDC is our new favorite website these days. There's FEMA data feeds. Like these are all examples of databases that you can go to to get free data that you can download and then use for your own uses. If you ever get the chance, like if you have the option for multiple types of data, government sources are the best. They are the holy grail of databases because they're considered to be the most accurate government sources like the BLS, the CDC. They're normally primary sources, meaning these people were the first ones to gather the information. And sites like this are set up to allow you to export the full data sets and work with them independently. So that's a huge advantage. If you ever get the chance to do it, uh, pull from the government data sources, they're, they're some of our favorites. Um, okay, so now let me show you an example of when you might wanna use data if you have an idea. So again, we're targeted entrepreneurs, people trying to launch their ideas. So let's pretend I have a product idea, okay? My idea is I wanna launch a smartphone app that identifies noise pollution in a city. Um, anything that's above a recommended safe level or could be damaging to your hearing. I've identified my customer pain point. I have some use cases of who I think is gonna use my product. So I'm well on the way to developing my product. But now I'm facing a critical juncture where I have limited resources and I need to know where I should launch my app first. Like what city, what region, what part of the country? I don't have enough money to do it everywhere. So what do I do? I have a decision to make. It'd be great to have some data to support this decision. So what can I do? Let me show you a couple options. One sec. Okay, let's start with bad data. Can you guys see this website screen? Thumbs up? Yeah, okay. This is the first result you get if you Google hearing disability in the US, okay? So a simple Google search, this is the first one that comes up. Take a look at this website. Let me scroll down real slow so you can see. Okay some of the challenges of this website that make it a less than desirable source for data. One is the actual source. It comes from city-data.com. Definitely not a verifiable source. Um, definitely not a government institution or something uh, that you would preferably trust. The challenge here is that they haven't given you any insights into their methodology. You don't know where they got their data from. You don't know how they did a survey. You don't even know when. They don't have a year or a time period or anything on here. So it's really difficult to say where this data came from. And verifiable means like if I repeated the survey, I could get very similar results. Well, they haven't even enabled me to be able to repeat the survey. So very challenging to verify these results. Um, they also haven't given us any option to export this data. So, you know, I could like copy paste this and drop it into an Excel file, but it's pretty challenging. And if you're working with a really large data set, that could be really difficult to do. So we wanna look for a better data source, something that's a little bit more reliable, a little bit more traceable, verifiable, and also gives us the ability to export. So the better data, we're going to the CDC website. It's everyone's favorite website these days. And again, we're looking for where we wanna launch our product to people that might have hearing disabilities that could benefit from an app like this. So the government recognizes hearing disabilities here as one of the dis disabilities they track. Uh, so the data's here. One of the great things is um, this data set tells you where it came from. So it says the data is provided by the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Natural, National Center on Birth Defects, et cetera. It tells you exactly where the data came from. It also tells you when it was last updated. It has some codes and it has a contact email in case you have any follow-up questions. So these are great signs and signals as you look at websites of things that might be better sources of data. And my favorite thing is it has this button up here that says export, okay? So for the next few minutes, I'm gonna do a live example of exporting a large data set and walking through it, cleaning it up, narrowing it down to the useful data. And then we'll go back to our PowerPoint and use the useful data to walk through actionable insights. So um, 
be patient with me. This is a little bit of a painful process. It's meant to be like, I want to show you how it actually works to kind of demystify data because it is not just as easy as it pops up and it's beautiful and it's clean and it's pretty, right? So we're going to walk through it step by step. So we're going to hit export. We're going to export it to Excel. Give us just a moment and it'll download. All right, I'm going to open up this site. And let me know if you can see Excel. Thumbs up? Not yet. I'm seeing head shaking. Let's try again. How about now? Excel? Okay, good. Okay, so this is the natural export you get um, when it comes from the CDC's website. It is challenging for sure. There's a lot of data in here. So just as an upfront, let's look down. We have 1,500 rows of data we're working with dozens of different columns, okay? So you've got a lot of data and we need to be able to sort through this quickly and get to some data that we can actually use. So here's what I'm gonna recommend we do. One of the very first things I like to do when you're working with data that has a header row, so basically this top row that tells you uh, a description of what the information below it is, throw on a filter, okay? Filters are great and here's why because you have 1500 rows and you could comb through that one by one and see, okay, like this is years. How many different years do I have? Or you can click this cute little arrow and it'll tell you, we only have the years 16, 17, 18. So really easy to get a quick overview of all the different data that's below you in those 1500 rows, okay? So filters, that's the first thing to remember. Throw on a filter if you can. The next thing is when you use these filters, as you click on the little arrows, you can see that for some columns, every value in the column is the same. Like for this one, every value is disability estimates, okay? So because it's the same throughout, it's not gonna help you differentiate among the data. So I recommend you either hide it, or if you're feeling bold like I am tonight, you can delete it, okay? So we're gonna go through and we're gonna delete some of these columns that are less useful to us, okay? Now be careful as you delete. Again, you can hide it if you're nervous and think you might want to undo it, but I've looked at this data set a few times, so I'm pretty sure I can delete out a few of these things. Um, so we're going to delete out these. These columns, totally blank, nothing there. So definitely get rid of columns like that. Anything that is not meaningful, anything that is not going to help you identify and sift through your data, take it out. It will definitely simplify what you're trying to do, okay? Uh, these columns here, these are confidence intervals. I'm not going to use them in this exercise, but they are real, so I'm just going to hide them for now, okay? You've got these two columns, columns E and F. These are data value and data value that ALT stands for alternative. Now, throughout, these are the same. So if you have duplicative data, that's another thing that you want to get rid of, okay? So now we're down to, let's look at what we have. We have a year column. We have a location and then we have a location description, which these are actually the same thing. Like you'll notice it's just an abbreviation and then a state name. So let's get rid of this one. Again, duplicative data. Then you have a column for response, which tells you what type of disability this person is self-identifying with. And then you have your data value. So this is the percentage of people in that state who are identifying with this certain disability, okay? And then you have an absolute number, you have a weighted number, et cetera. We're not gonna mess with those for now. So you've taken this giant data set, you've thinned it down into these few columns that are the most useful. Next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna insert a pivot table. So I love pivot tables, I think they're great. It's gonna open up a new sheet for you. And now when you do a pivot table, you have the ability to move things around real quickly, which can be very helpful. So again, let's pause for a second and let's remember the question that we're trying to ask, right? The question is, what places, in this case states, have the highest hearing disability or the highest hearing loss problems. That's what we wanna target with our product, right? So let's go with locations in the rows, okay? So we've got our states listed out here. Then we also wanna filter so we just get hearing disabilities, right? Because there were all kinds of disabilities. So let's say we only want hearing disabilities, okay? Uh, years, we probably wanna filter by years. Remember we had 16, 17, 18. So I always like to default to the latest and greatest data. So let's say 2018. And then we're gonna take our data value and we're gonna drag it into values. Okay, 
So what we've done here is we've organized. We're now down to two columns. We've sifted to just 2018 and just hearing disabilities. So what this is giving us is a list of states and the percentage of people in 2018 that identified this as a, having a hearing disability, okay? Now, again, with meaningful and non-meaningful data, if it doesn't mean something to you, take it out, okay? So I'm a student, I'm trying to launch this product. I don't think I can launch it in Guam. So I'm gonna take Guam out. I don't want to do a region. I only have enough money maybe to do one or two states. So I'm going to take out these regions and I'm going to be left with just a list of states that I feel like I can actually realistically launch to. So you have this list, but this is still a pretty long list, right? Like you're looking at 50 rows or so. So how do you take this long list and make it quicker and easier to read? One of my favorite things to do is to use conditional formatting. So you highlight the whole data set that you want to look at. And we're gonna go up here to conditional formatting. It has these great thing called color scales. So you select a color scale and it's gonna color things, either higher is red or higher is green. In this case, I've said the higher the number, the higher the hearing disability, so I wanna make it red. So what this allows you to do is to quickly identify the high and low values in the data set. So for example, you can see, boom, District of Columbia, one of the lowest ones in the whole data set. Even without looking at the bottom of the list, you can see it's one of the lowest. Arkansas, kind of mid-pack, maybe a little high because it's slightly orange, but it's not red, so that's good, right? So tell me now, as you scroll down, what is the glaringly obvious number you're seeing? Yeah, West Virginia. Okay, so West Virginia here clearly the highest above and beyond any of the other states in reporting hearing disabilities. It's at 12.4% and it's so bright red because none of the other states around it are nearly as high. So this is our data. We did all of that analysis, all of that sifting through 1500 rows and dozens of columns to get to this piece of data, which is the one I want to use, right? I'm trying to launch my product. Now I know where I can launch because I can see immediately West Virginia has one of the highest hearing disabilities. So uh, let me switch back to my PowerPoint screen. Hold on just a sec. Can we see the PowerPoint screen? Thumbs up. Okay, great. Um, so now what I wanna do is walk you guys through, you have that piece of data, right? We know West Virginia, 12.4%. How do you take that piece of data, that one random fact, and how do you turn it into an actionable insight for your product, okay? So I have a framework here I'm gonna present to you. You have the data. This is the very bottom of the pyramid. It's the very start of your work. So the piece of data here is, again, 12.4% West Virginia's population. That's an objective observation you gathered on research. It's a quantitative value. And now that you have that nailed down, we can progress through. The next thing you wanna do on your path towards an actionable insight is turn that piece of data into a fact. So a fact, a fact is when you take a piece of data and you compare it to other data points using a relative or trend metrics. So you wanna remember the acronym ART, A-R-T. It stands for actual, relative, and trend. And what that means is you're gonna have a superlative word in here like higher, highest, faster, slowest, right? That exemplifies that you're doing a comparison. So in this case, we're comparing the hearing disability rates in West Virginia, Kentucky, and Wyoming, and saying those three are the highest of all the states. So that's a relative comparison, okay? The next thing you're going to do on your path is try to get to an insight. So an insight is when you take this piece of data that you have and you connect it to a seemingly unrelated other fact, and it makes you say, hmm, that's interesting. So the seemingly unrelated fact that we're comparing to today is that coal mining jobs are the highest in West Virginia, Kentucky, and Wyoming. So you have these two facts that seem to be unrelated. Coal mining jobs are the highest there. Hearing disabilities are the highest there. So this, by the way, this does not prove causation. It does not prove that one caused the other. It simply proves that they're connected, okay? The same states are affected by these same two things. Now, the next thing that you want to do, you always want to bring your data to action. You want to be able to recommend an action that if you were like the manager or the owner or the leader of a company, you could make a decision based upon this information. So in this case, for my product, my app that I want to develop, my action is 
we should target cities and towns near coal mines because that's where we'll find consumers that are affected by noise pollution. So these last two bits here, the insight and the action, those are what's most useful to leadership, right? When you do senior executive presentations, this is what's most important to tell them. They're less interested in the data. They probably don't have time to sift through it. So as much as you can do that and deliver them insights and actions, that'll be things that they find super useful. All right, so now we're gonna give you guys the chance to practice this. So we're gonna go into some breakout rooms that Stacy's gonna set up. And in your breakout rooms, I want you guys to start with a piece of data. It can be anything, like a fact you heard on the news, something from your research paper last week, like whatever. Start with a piece of data and work it through this framework. And then when we come back together, I want you to share with me what action you're gonna take based on the piece of data that you started with, okay? Let me pause. Any questions before we go to breakout rooms? Okay, we're we're about to go. I just also want to say if you're in breakout group number one, will you do me a favor and not accept your invitation to go to the breakout room? We're recording, so it's just nice to have some of the conversation captured. So for those of you in breakout room one, just go ahead and stay here and ignore your invite. Okay, heading off. Maybe let's kick it off with a quick intro. Who's in our room here? Hi, I'm Sai. I'm an uh, undergraduate economics major and um, yeah. Hi Sai, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Okay, well it might just be, I know Rachel. Hey Rachel. Yeah, hey. Okay. Okay, well, it might just be the three of us and we can we can do a practice round. So Sai, um, hit us with a piece of data, like something you've collected or randomly know, and we'll work off that. Hold on, you're on mute. I can't hear you. I don't think I have one like at the top of my head. You don't have like a favorite economics fact or something you've seen in the news recently? No. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, Rachel, you got anything for us? Maybe something on vaccines. Yeah, okay. Let's go with that. So let's say we're getting um, a million vaccines a week into people's arms, right? Like Joe Biden's been saying that. So let's start with a million vaccines a week. That's your piece of data, okay? So next step is to take it to a fact. So a fact would compare it to other pieces of data that are similar, like a relative or a trend. So what do you think? Would the rate of vaccines, is that something you would trend over time or something you'd compare? Sai, what do you think? You would trend it over yeah. time, right? Good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So give me an example of a trend. You can make it up. It doesn't have to be real. Um, I guess vaccine distribution over time or yeah. over, the, over a few months. Yeah. So let's say it's mm -hmm. doubled over a few months, right? So we said mm -hmm. we're at a million uh, per week today and a couple months ago, it was half of that. So our vaccine distribution has doubled in the last few months, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, now we're gonna connect it to another piece of data. So this is where we get to the insights, where we're connecting it to something seemingly unrelated. So uh, Renette, you're on our call. Welcome, how are you? I'm good, thank you. <laughs> good. Can you Can you suggest to us like a, a random piece of data, you can make it up? that might be connected to the fact that vaccine distribution has doubled over the last few months. It can be anything, it doesn't have to be real. Um, that uh, random piece of data that, um, I don't know, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay, uh, let me give you a random suggestion. What if the sale of Big Macs has also doubled in the last few months? So. Vaccine distribution has doubled and sale of Big Macs have doubled. Does that seem plausible? Uh, no, but okay. <laughs> so that's what's interesting is like, it's a seemingly unrelated piece of data, right? So you, you don't mm -hmm. think that they're related. And again, doesn't prove causation. It just says mm, they mm -hmm. might be connected, right? Uh, so then that would lead you to an action that you could take because you know this, right? Mm -hmm. So if you knew that Big Mac sales were up, and you knew that vaccine distributions were up, 
say you're a manager at a local McDonald's, what action might you take? You might like, uh, give a freebie. Yeah. Oh, Come in, buy, buy one, get one free. Uh, go, go get your vaccine, prove you've gotten your vaccine. Buy one, get one free. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like, show your vaccine card. Yeah. Get a free that's big it. Bag. Perfect. Yeah, that's great. So that's like a real actionable thing a manager can do to help his business based upon this data that you connected to this insight and this conclusion you helped him draw, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Did anybody else want to do an example? I kind of did that one. And that was good too. <laughs> Very creative. It was good. We've probably been about three, four minutes. So I can go ahead and close the rooms if you'd like, Brooke. Yeah, let's pull everybody back. I'm interested to see what they got. Okay. All right, so we're waiting for everybody to come back from the breakout rooms and I hope you guys are ready to share. I wanna hear what you came up with in your room. So uh, let me do a little cold calling. Uh, Kyle, Kyle, can you share with us what your group came up with in your room? Yeah, I'm, I'm outside, so I apologize if you hear the cars. Um, we came up with uh, the data we use from my community back home. I, I live in Johnson County, Kansas. They send us a daily COVID-19 update report. Um, in March of 2020, the positivity rate, which means for every person tested who tested positive, was at around 8%. It spiked up to about 16% at the highest that I saw the report say. And then now, um, as of yesterday, I saw a report that said we're down to about 4.2%. So um, just kind of seeing how that trend worked. And we talked about some reasons behind that. Um, the insight being that people learn more about the virus and were able to reduce that positivity rate. And then the action being to kind of keep doing what you're doing, if you will, and, and try to um, continue to make that rate go down. Yeah, that's great. So you looked at COVID positivity rates and you trended them over time. So you could see how they're fluctuating. And then you compared it to maybe the education that the county is putting out about COVID prevention. And maybe as the COVID positive rate declined, that's why when education was increasing. And so you compare those two and the action you take away is you should continue doing the education because it's having an impact on your COVID rates. Thanks, Kyle. Yeah. Um, let me see, uh, Angela, what'd you guys have in your group? Uh, we had trouble coming up with a data point, so three minutes is very short for us to really go through everything, but we started out with my background, I work in produce safety, and so I was looking at a statistic of the FDA outbreaks linked to produce safety by pathogen type, and so we were looking at the numbers of, of how the hospi hospitalization, there was like more hospitalizations due to bacterial pathogen types as opposed to parasitic and viral. And so by the time we got to that point, we ran out of time. So I don't know where we we're going with that. But. Okay, so you're saying the packaging type determines the infection rate of the food, is that right? Oh, path of the pathogen type. Pathogen. So what caused the illness, was it a bacteria, was it a parasite or was it a viral issue? Okay, it's got mainly it. bacterial. So. I see, I see, okay. So let's think through that for a second. So if you have this data about the pathogen types and you know about the different foodborne illnesses that you could have, um, how might you compare that? So would you do it as a trend over time? Would you do it as a relative comparison? How would you set that up? Yeah, I guess a relative comparison based on like how many illnesses were reported in that year and then weight it from there to see if, if there are more viruses that are coming into play, COVID maybe, um, or, or if, if, that, if parasites are or more of an issue as time goes on. And then maybe you can develop insight as to, well, what is creating that change? Is it something to do with the soil, uh, regional food supply chains, the water issues that are going on? So all sorts of things you could gather from there. Yeah, that's a great point. Like you might say, this one region had a lot of foodborne illnesses. They also had a lot of flooding this year. And so you could say those two are seemingly unrelated, but actually occurred in, you know, in synchronization. And therefore, when you have flooding, you should do more testing of the food to check for foodborne illnesses. So great, right. great insight, good takeaway. Let me go back to sharing my screen real quick. Okay, thanks for participating in that. 
The next thing I want to talk to you about in your data storytelling uh, workshop is about your audience. Okay, so who you're presenting to is a huge factor in how well your messaging lands. There's this great quote that says designing a presentation without an audience in mind is like writing a love letter and addressing it to whom it may concern, which sounds crazy, right? But every presentation you do has to be targeted at your audience. And there's a lot you may or may not know about your audience, but everything you do know, you need to put into practice. So there are often unseen audience factors, like things that you need to know about your audience that will not always be immediately obvious. So I'm going to identify six of them here for you tonight. So the first one is knowledge. What does your audience know? What do they not know? What do you need them to know? The next one is their attitude. How are they coming into this presentation? Do they have any pre-existing biases you need to know about? The third one is a voice. What voice do they really have in making these decisions that you're trying to get them to make? The fourth is emotions. What are their emotions? Are they stressed? Are they tired? Are they distracted? Maybe in a hurry. You need to know these if you're trying to talk to them. The fifth one is incentives. How are these people that are listening to you incentivized? Is it by money? Is it by time, by reputation? Like what are their driving factors? This is important to know. And the sixth one is their logic. How do these people think? Do they think logically through, they like um, maybe math, logic, uh, facts and figures, or are they more storytellers, visionaries, artists, like they think more abstractly? You need to know about them so that you can present to them in the way that is most efficient and easiest for them to understand, okay? So we're gonna do another breakout room exercise. Um, I mean, we're gonna split into different breakout rooms and each breakout room is assigned a different audience, okay? So I've made up some audiences here. These are totally random and it's a huge variety. Everything from like your roommates and neighbors, your family, maybe a group of college professors, a kindergarten class, like totally random groupings, but they have easily identifiable characteristics, okay? So as you go to your breakout room, whatever number room you are is the audience that you're gonna analyze. And you're gonna analyze them on these six unseen factors. And we're gonna put in the chat a Google Sheet. And the Google Sheet has a tab for each breakout room and it's got a list of the six factors. So nominate one person in your room to be a scribe and they can type out um, you know, and help collect responses for each of these factors. Joe or Kyle or Federico, are y'all there? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, Kyle. Joe just wrote hey. it off, so. Hi, Gabriella. Hi, you said breakout room two stays, right? Yeah. Okay, perfect. I accidentally, out of habit, pressed join breakout room. No worries, that's good. Okay, so we're room two, which if I look at the Excel sheet, it says we got the audience of Google software engineers. Uh, does everybody have the Google sheet open? Mm -hmm. Check the chat for the link. I have it open. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, Angela, you, you want to take notes? We can talk through it. Yeah, that'd be great. Cool. So our first element is logic. What kind of logic do you think Google software engineers use? Engineers logic, very analytical and straightforward, no jargon, no slang, like very technical. Yeah, I would agree. And let's just say they focus on metrics and, and how to measure things um, in terms of their progress rather than, I guess, uh, uh, quantitative is what the word. Yeah. How about their incentives? How do you think these software engineers at Google are incentivized? Um, maybe like bonuses, job uh, raises, promotions, um, just keeping their job in general. Yeah, so they're motivated by whatever the company goals are, maybe whatever their team goals are. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a lot of room for personal motivation here? Maybe it could kind of also, depending if it's like teamwork. Um, yeah, I guess personal motivation as well. Yeah. Yeah, I think anyone who is a engineer for Google is pretty, um, 
personally motivated already um, and probably really creative and did something special to get there. So um, definitely personal motivation is also an incentive. Yeah. Okay, the next one's emotions. So let's pretend that this is, you know, a pretty high stakes presentation. We're deep in the code development with this group of software engineers. What kind of emotions do you think they have? Probably some nerves and uh, I'd say, you know, uh, a bit of uh, performance anxiety. Yeah, probably some stress as well. Probably a stressful job working at Google. Yeah. Okay, what about their knowledge? What do these people know? What do they not know? And then pretend, what do we need them to learn from us? They need to know why we're there and um, what's the what's the goal with all of this. Yeah, like, good is point. there a step that they need to take. Yeah, they want to know why we're here and what we need from them like they need us to be clear on our expectations. What else. Anything else on knowledge? Anything you think that they don't know that you might be able to tell them? Like if you're presenting to them about something. And I, I guess if, if you have like a, like a certain topic, you, you'd, wanna, you'd wanna let them know about the topic that you're educating them on. So if let's say it's financial metrics that you're trying to track, how that relates to them. Yeah, great point. So anything outside their core subject matter, like anything not engineering and not software, you're going to need to bring them up to speed on. So whether that's finance and you need to talk to them about their budget or their P&L, um, maybe it's design and you want to talk to them about like color or customer experience. Those are all things you're going to have to educate them on. They don't know. Okay, how about attitude? What do you think their attitude is as you're coming to them with this idea that you have that's gonna require them to do a lot of work? Um, I would say probably not the best attitude. Um, I don't know specifically like what, but maybe, you know, not probably looking forward to the presentation or the information. Um, that would be my guess if it's a lot of work. Yeah, great point. I keep thinking that if, if someone's working at Google, they have they have excelled in their in their sphere and they may think that you're coming to them with a knowledge base below theirs. Maybe they mm. feel like maybe there's an ego at play here. Yeah, that's a great yeah. point. They definitely feel overqualified. That's great. Okay, so last one is voice. So voice could also be influence. Like how much influence does this room of software engineers have over the creation of our product? If it's a tech heavy product, they would have the strongest voice since they would be leading all of all of that. They would have that knowledge base and could leverage a lot of power in the discussion too. If it's something outside of tech, um, they would have a smaller voice and a weaker voice. Yeah, that's exactly right. Perfect. Anything else to add? Any other points you guys would say about this room of Google software engineers? I'd say come at it from a standpoint of 
a bit of humility because if you don't know something you're asking them to do, then you need to understand the workload they're about to take on. Yeah, that's hugely important. We're um, about at time, so I'm gonna. Yeah, pull them back, sure. Thanks for note taking, Angela, that was great. Yeah, anytime. All right, we're bringing everybody back from the breakout rooms. I'm gonna ask one person to share on their audience and what they learned about their audience by going through these six factors. Um, any volunteers? Anybody wanna share? Kara, what, what room were you in? Who was your audience? Well, I am first in line on the screen, so I don't blame you for choosing me. However, I joined the Zoom late because of school pickup, so I had just gotten there, but we had a yoga class, and our group, I knew a lot about yoga and nothing about what we had talked about so far since I just joined. My other two members knew what the presentation had been and nothing about yoga, so uh, <laughs> it was a bit of a group effort. And what I would say is uh, in thinking, in reflecting on uh, the dynamics that you've given, you know, if you're in a yoga class, you're really just a participant. So you don't have a ton of voice in what's happening. Um, I wouldn't necessarily rate them super high on a logic scale. Like I've been in a lot of yoga classes. I wouldn't say that's most people's first approach to um most things if they're seeking out uh yoga um i guess a nice part would be that you would expect a pretty emotionally tranquil um relaxed so for attitude and emotion you would expect a pretty calm and receptive audience um which one am i what am i missing still i don't have the thing in front of me but no, that was um, great. That's perfect. It sounds like you guys, we had the room of Google software engineers. So it sounds like you had the polar opposite of that group. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say so. Okay, perfect. Anybody else want to share about their audience or anything they learned as they were talking through the idea of audience factors? Cool. Okay, well, knowing your audience is a really key component of being able to tell your story. Again, you should always tailor your message as best you can to whatever format and whatever visualization is best for them. So uh, I want to wrap it up a little bit by touching on visualizations of data. So there are so many different ways that you can visualize data, but I want you to always think through, can you go from good to better to best? So earlier in the, in the uh, workshop, we looked at that data set from the CDC, right? And we did our conditional formatting and we put things in order and we isolated state and percentage, right? So we put it in this uh, table, that pivot table we had, remember? And we used conditional formatting to highlight it. So this is a, a good visualization of data. Like there's some coloring, there's some organization, like things are in a, a somewhat order. So this is okay. If this was all you had, it's definitely better than just text, it's good but how can we make it better? So let's think about how to visualize it a little bit more. What if you could put in bar charts that represented uh, the percentage of people who had hearing disabilities in the state? Um, and then you could order the bar so the highest was on top, so you could sort it a little bit easier. And you could really see that the length of some bars is almost double the length of others. So it starts to give you a little bit more insight, a little bit more context around the data set, and it's easier to absorb, right? Like you can look at this quickly and see which ones are big, which ones are small. So that's always a good thing. But how could it be the best, okay? Because this still is a list of 50 states and 50 different bars, and that's super difficult to read all the way through and absorb. And it's hard to draw conclusions about how things are set up geographically. So anytime you're working with a data set that's focused on locations, I strongly recommend a map. It's a great way to visualize it. So this one has got some color coding done by state to say like, in the states that are darker color green, that's a higher percentage of hearing disability. So beyond just being able to absorb the numbers quickly, you also start to get some clues about regional similarities. Like if you notice what's going on there in the, in the Midwest South region around Oklahoma, Kentucky, Louisiana, Alabama, like those are all a darker color in that part of the country compared to the Northeast or even the Midwest, right? So there's something going on there that's related to geography and 
dispersion uh, in that uh, central area. That's an insight that would have been really difficult to draw from the chart in the middle that's just the bar charts, right? So anytime you can put it together, that's super nice. The last thing I want to talk to you about are some different tools that you can use for data visualization. So you have basically endless options for how you want to visualize data. The simplest is the one on the left, which is the built in charts that are available to you in Excel and PowerPoint and everything you saw on that last sl slide, like the conditional formatting, the bar charts, even the map. Those are all available in Excel without add ons like they're just in the Microsoft program one click and you can add them. This is the simplest. It's also the easiest to manipulate. So if you're a beginner with data visualization, I recommend you start there. If you want to get a little bit more advanced, there are lots of tools and add ons that you can do things like Power BI, Tableau, Python, like different ways, different tools, subscriptions that can help you visualize data even better. And then the last thing, which is really like the most robust and, and engaging visually you can have is when there's movement or animation. The great thing about animation is you can show change over time. So in a typical chart, right, you've got two axes. In an animation, you can have a third axis, which is time and how things have evolved and changed over time, which can be really helpful if you're trying to tell a story about how things have moved over time, right? Remember that trend we talked about earlier? This is how you visualize a trend. So animations, there are lots of web add-ons you can do. Um, I would recommend like you be very pointed when you use animations. It can get out of control too fast if you've got a ton in a presentation. So use one or two here or there to be really impactful about things that have changed. So that's it for my presentation tonight. I would love to take your questions like, and I'm, I'm happy to stay as long as needed to see what you guys wanna ask. Um, and just a note here, I'm gonna drop a survey into the chat like we do here to get your guys' feedback on this. We'd love to hear, Brooke would love to hear. Um, it's about the content, all of it. Just tell us your thoughts, be open and honest with us. So I'll drop that if you don't mind um, filling that out at some point. And, I'm going to let Brooke take it over again with questions, but just want to remind you too that we do have um, a workshop next week on identifying and sizing market opportunities at the same time. So feel free to join us then. Questions for Brooke. Um, earlier you or in your presentation, you mentioned um, kind of knowing like what data websites to trust and which ones not to trust, like what advice do you have for, because my minor is analytics and I work a lot with websites like that. So like, what would you say, would you just say like stick to like the main like government websites to pull data from, or like, how do you kind of like um, figure out like which one is reliable data and which one isn't? Yeah, so the three things that I would focus on to find a good data source are one, is it verifiable? So do they tell you how they did the research, when they did it, where they did it, or if they're pulling from somewhere else, do they tell you where they're pulling it from and cite all their sources accordingly? Because what that should enable you to do is go verify their source. Like you could repeat the experiment or you could repeat the survey in the exact same conditions they did and you should get the same data set. So if it's verifiable, that's really nice. The second one is if, um, if it's exportable, if they allow you to like pull it off and put it in Excel like we did with that CDC data, usually that means the data is a lot more trustworthy because they'll let you take it and manipulate it. If you're looking at a website that's got like an infographic and you can't copy the numbers and whatnot, that's going to be a lot harder to work with and a lot harder to, to organize. So I look for things that export. And then the third thing is you want to have a source that you can go back to for questions, whether it's uh, like an email address, it's a, you know, a Q and A site, something like that, somewhere you can ask questions so that if you get questions about your data, you can go back to the source and say, Hey, I pulled from this website. I'll follow up and find out from this person how they did such and such. All right, thank you. Yeah. It looks like we have a question from Kyle in the chat here. What is your opinion on Power BI versus Excel for data visualization? Yeah, so I would recommend Power BI if you're going to be doing a repetitive report over and over, like a weekly report, monthly report, something that you have to recreate um, on a regular basis because you can automate that in Power BI. Like you can have the data set, you can import it, it's already set up, one click, you know, and you're ready to go. 
If it's a one-time thing, like you only need to do the data once, like how we did tonight for the CDC, if that's the only time I'm ever going to need to do it and the data is not going to get republished, then I would just do it once in Excel and knock it out. Because with a, with a tool like Power BI, there is a significant upfront time investment to, um, to set it all up and get it ready to go. But again, if you're doing it many, many times every single week or month, it's worth it to do that upfront to have it clean and, and consistent. Awesome, thank you. Um, we do have another question from Kara. Do you have something that you like better than PowerPoint for display of your data visualization? I'm a big PowerPoint fan, but I'm like a super user. Like I feel like I can manipulate it pretty well. And like my company has nice templates I can use and things. If you're starting from scratch, I would look into like some themes that you can use in PowerPoint that will help you with coloring and organizing your graphs. Um, I, it's really my favorite tool. I don't recommend much beyond it. I do think PowerPoint is significantly better than Excel if you get the choice. Like PowerPoint's a lot easier to manipulate and you can do better design work in there. So PowerPoint better than Excel. Well, thank you guys for being here. Um, we're going to stay on the line. If anyone wants to stay on and have any questions that they don't feel like asking in front of the group, feel free to stay on. Um, but thank you guys for being here. We really appreciate it and hope it's uh, been a good time for you. Thank you, Brooke, very much for your time. Thanks, guys.